All right, Grove Avenue Baptist Church, are you ready to worship this morning? And if you're watching with us on the broadcast or on the internet, we want you to worship right along with us. You can sing right where you are. Now, I need you to help us out this morning like this. Here we go. Come on. Sing it. I was buried beneath my shame. That's it. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. That's it. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried. Too high. It was my dream till I met you. All right, sing it out. You called my name. rescued us. Is that your story this morning? I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my king.
purpose to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father praise the son praise the spirit three in one God of glory majesty
Folks, this morning we worship the risen Lord. Amen? He did not just go to the cross. And he's not still in the tomb because he overcame death and the grave for us. Folks, someday we'll be worshiping him every day, forever and ever. Amen. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. And nothing compares to this. Amen.
you know this old chorus. Sing it with me. I surrender all. That's it. I surrender all. We surrender our lives to you, Lord. All to Sing that chorus again, just the chorus. I surrender all. Jesus, I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Jesus, I surrender all. Amen. Lord Jesus, we pause for this moment in prayer. So many people in this room, so many people watching have needs. They've come into this house to feed off the faith of so many. They need this moment to engage and experience you to get through their week. Some of them troubled, some of them dressed the part, yet inside they're struggling. Lord, I pray that as just the last few minutes we have sang praises of you and your power and your control, that you would give every listener the assurance that you are right there and you will never leave them and you will never forsake them. Where can we go from your spirit? Where could we possibly flee from your presence, the psalmist says. But Lord, if there's one anchor to put our hope in right now, when everything else is crazy in this world, it is the hope that you alone can change a heart and save their soul. And even in this crazy world, we know that if we put our faith in you, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, we know one thing for sure, that when we pass off this earth into eternity, we will be in an eternity with you and in the arms of you, our holy God. And for that, we say, praise the name of the Lord, our God. Until then, Lord, give us this confidence that trusting you today, trusting you today is all we have to do to get through. So, Lord, I thank you for the gospel. And I thank you for your promise that once we are children of God, we will never have that relationship severed. So I pray today, Lord, for anyone that under the sound of my voice will hear the pure truth of the gospel. And maybe today be the day of salvation. Maybe today be the time they mark their spiritual birthday as a child of God. Lord, let no one listening in change that channel. Let everyone pause to hear the truth of the gospel today. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord this morning. He is wonderful, isn't he? Isn't he great? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. We are, we are excited to address yet again in our series, House of Prayer, Colossians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 6, today's service is all about praying for the lost. Praying for the lost. It's a day where we get our eyes off of our situations for a moment and cast all of our focus on praying for the lost, for that's for whom he came. The gospel is so beautiful. And for those of us that have accepted Christ for many, many years, that are familiar with the gospel message, that have walked with Jesus throughout our lives, though we've had ups and downs, I think we'll all agree that the most important decision we ever made in our lives, the most important decision 
is that moment where we just stopped our world and took a knee and said, oh God, I know that I am a sinner and I have no hope without you. And I know that if I have to pay for my own sinfulness myself, there's no way that I can cleanse my own sinfulness. I know I have the sin. I mean, we all remember that moment. We all knew we weren't perfect like God. We learned, there was a point in time where we learned throughout the scriptures that it's called a, a sin element. It's sin within our hearts. And no matter how I can clean up and no matter how many times I can frequent the church house or, or watch it online, no matter how many times I, I appreciate charitable entities and, and I go in Christmas and Easter, there comes a time where we realize that regardless of all of that, that does not yet change my heart. There's nothing I can do that would infuse and clean the sin taint of my life. I'll never forget the moment that we, just like you, I realized the fact that I cannot change my sinfulness, and even though I try to clean up the act, I can't do it. It was an immediate feeling of hopelessness. Because at that moment, I realized I have no hope. And you realize that too, if you're a true Christian. You realize there comes to a point that nothing, nothing we can do can change our sinful state. Nothing can translate it from darkness into light. I can't do enough charitable deeds. I can't grace the church house. I can't, I can't do a lot of charitable things. I can't give enough money. No matter what, I, there's nothing I can do to redeem my soul, to forgive my sinfulness. And the scriptures take us right there and they pause us and they say, feel that moment of desperation. Get lost before you get saved. You'll never understand the glories and the beauty of the gift of the gospel if you first don't know how desperate your soul is. So every single man, woman, boy, or girl who walks this earth is literally, according to Ephesians 2, literally this close to being called children related to his wrath, children of wrath. You are literally, you, some people don't even have a clue that they're not at peace with God. And without God intervening some way, there is no way no man, woman, boy, or girl can ever experience eternity in heaven or peace with God right now. It's a sobering truth. You know, it's funny. It's not funny. It's actually kind of sad that, that there are many people that try to, try to present the gospel in, a, in, a, in kind of that American way. Except Christ in your life will get better. No, most of the time, and, and definitely in other countries, you accept Christ, your life gets worse. No, your bills will not be paid. No, there's not a promise of anything. This, that's an American concept, and don't ever deprive someone of that truth. We have to share the truth in love that everyone is in need of forgiveness. We can't save ourselves, and it's not a promise of physical blessings or, problem that, or a promise that all your promises will go away. It comes down to the point of saying, I need to have peace with God. And then, after I have peace with God, then I will have a power source to walk through this life with me. But there's no promise of instant joy or promises that I'll find a job. It's just, I think that a lot of people might have economic peace, political peace, social peace, familiar peace. But there are a lot of people walking around this world that do not realize they do not have peace with God. And that's why you accept Christ. Not for a blessing. Not for any kind of promise of good life, which will not come. You say, I need peace with God because my creator created me, then I disobeyed him, and now we're not right. If we don't have peace, I can't have a peaceful relationship in heaven someday. God knew that need, all of mankind. Then God wrapped himself in flesh. He came on this earth because man needed a man to forgive man's sins, but that man needs to be perfect, holy. Well, the only perfect and holy one is God. So I need a God-man here. God wraps himself in flesh, comes to this earth, lives a perfect, sinless life, dwells among his people. John chapter 1 says he came to his own and his creation and his own received him not. But there were a few of you that received him and he gave the authority to become children of God. They didn't like his message, saying that he was the savior of the world. As a result, they all came against him and they 
mocked him and spitefully entreated. In fact, Josephus says that he was on the cross, didn't even look like the form of a man. The Gospel of Mark says they pulled his beard out. They covered his head with a, a cloak and say, predict, O Messiah, who just struck you. And he didn't open his mouth. Then Pilate, the ruler, says, I have the authority to release you or condemn you. And Jesus said, you don't have any authority against me because what I'm doing, I'm doing willfully. I am choosing this path. No man stops me. No man takes it away from me. He goes to the cross. They're screaming. They're multiple times attempting to get him to not go to the cross. The evil one at that moment tried multiple times to get him to go to the cross. You remember in the temptation of Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus, as the evil one, tried three times and says, listen, just bow down to me. I'll give you all of this. We can bypass this cross thing. Because the moment he dies and rises again, all hope of having peace with God is now available to man. Jesus said, do not tempt the Lord your God. Well, just fall off this cliff, and everyone will see your angels pick you up, and then they'll start worshiping you. You can get to your desired result, and you can bypass all this cross pain stuff. And Jesus said, no, I have the will of the Father to be done. He goes, well, just make bread, and you're hungry. And that would then cause him to sin and cause him not to be able to fulfill forgiveness for all mankind. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan, and his angels minister to him. Then he walked through everything, and in John chapter 7, his brother said, why don't you just go to the temple and reveal yourself? He goes, it's not time. John chapter 2, in the marriage of Cana, and just in the miracles of the water and the wine, he said, now keep this quiet because the time isn't right. So many people asked him to pronounce and, and announce it, just say, just say who you are. And he goes, no, no, no. And then finally, it was the time. And he let everyone know that I am the true Messiah. I am literally come to earth to show people how they can commune with God. I literally dwelt among them. They needed a perfect man who was God to be able to die, pay the sacrifice for their sin, rise again three days later, proving all my words were true, and then I can offer forgiveness for all mankind. Finally, he raised Lazarus from the dead. They said, this guy has got to go to the cross. That would be the most expedient thing to do, to wipe this guy off the face of the earth, to just rid us of their problem. Make sure he goes to the cross so that Rome doesn't hear that we're causing problems over here in Jerusalem so that they don't wipe out our nation. John 3.16 says, little do they know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That night in the garden, he was suffering, beaten, spat upon, spitefully entreated, 24-hour all-nighter. He literally walked a multi-mile path carrying the cross, going and getting beaten to seven different trials. And finally, he's bearing his cross up, and there were people shouting at him. And they're like, are you really the son of God? Are you really the son of God? Pilate's like, I could release you right now if you just say these magic words. He kept his mouth shut. He gets to the cross. He's hanging on the cross. Even the centurion said, if you're really the son of God, get off that thing moments before he expired. Don't let Jesus go to the cross, the evil one and all of his minions are planning because if he goes to the cross if he goes to the cross and rises again then salvation is offered for every single person who calls upon the name of the Lord Amen. while he's suffering on that cross he's getting mocked he's getting spat upon they're offering him little Juice and he denies it, so that would even up his pain. He doesn't want it. He then sparks a conversation with two people to his left and his right. This man mocks him. This man believes in him, and he says, today you will be with me in paradise. While he is suffering, he's bringing souls to him. Right before he declares his finished work, he looks down and takes care of his mother. What a selfless, selfless boy. So John, behold your mother, because even his own brothers did not believe his own family members, so he had to dispose the care of his mom to a friend. In fact, it says his own brothers didn't believe till after they saw their brother Jesus rise from the dead. Oh, by the way, when his brothers did see Jesus rise from the dead, they started championing the truth. The book of James is written by his brother. The book of Jude written by his brother. And they say, now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, to present us faultless before Christ to the only pure son of God, his brother. James, a servant 
of Jesus Christ. But it took the resurrection three days. He's on the cross. He expires. The world is dark. They're afraid. They're wondering what's going to happen. Sunday morning, women run to the tomb. What are we going to see? We're just coming here to pay our continued homage because it was so rushed to get through the Sabbath, to get, to, to, to get him in the tomb before we had to rest and do no work. So they just continued to pay their homage. They just said, can he be around just so I can pay my final respects? And they meet a, a, an angelic being that says, why are you searching here among the dead? For he is not here, for he is risen. Go tell your disciples. And then he entered into that house and he said, feel my hands, feel my feet. And they said, oh, Lord, my God. Because Jesus had risen from the dead, and from that moment, every single disciple died and paid their life for the message of the gospel because they had not only hugged the neck of Christ, they had not only heard the truth of Christ, but they had lived with Christ, and they had seen the risen Lord, and they realized that at this moment, they have something that is so extraordinary to offer every single friend, man, woman, boy, and girl, and it's a way to not just have a good life, it's a way not just to have blessings in life, but it's a way to have eternal salvation and peace with God. God. And it's worth living for. And it's worth dying for. And it's the good news that continues even today. Even today, that message has not changed. Jesus on the Mount of Olives, when he ascends back into heaven, he says, go and make disciples, be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Every single Christian from that moment, 2,000, 20 years ago till now, is their whole goal is to share that great commission, to share the gospel and to make disciples that people will share and make more disciples of Jesus Christ. And every single person today is offered salvation even though you have a sin condition that you cannot affect, God stepped in. God took all of your sin that you've ever committed, ever are going to in the future, and placed it upon his heart. And he paid the penalty for that sin so that you wouldn't have to pay the penalty for that sin. And when he rose again, he conquered sin and death and said, now I can touch the inside internal heart condition that you're unable to touch. If you ask me to forgive you of your sinfulness, I have the ability to split bone and marrow. I have the ability to insert right into the most intimate parts of your heart. And you admit that I am God, that I'm the only one that can save your sin, that I died, that I rose again. If you ask me to forgive you of your sins, I will forgive you right now. And you can be translated from a creation of God into the family of God forever. And that's what Paul is in prison proclaiming today. I pray that anyone under the sound of my voice. Here's that truth, and you might have heard it for a hundred times, but for some reason, the Lord's just saying, just pause right now and listen. Don't change. Don't change this channel. In fact, we're actually, when we go off the broadcast at 12 noon, we're going to keep the service live on grovav.tv and on our Facebook, and I want you to stay with us. You're going to hear a little bumper at this song at the end, and then we're going to come back live because we're going to have a prayer time for you. And I want to encourage you. To think of a name right now. Think of someone that at the end of this service you can pray for. But then also I want you to also pray for the Lord to give you an opportunity this week to share the gospel. Pray for a name and then pray for an opportunity to share the gospel. And then lastly, pray you will take, this is huge, pray that you'll take advantage of that opportunity. You pray for an opportunity to share the gospel 100%, I promise you God will give it to you. 100%. It is the will of God to share the gospel. 100%. God, give me an opportunity this week, and he will. The question is, are you going to walk through that open door? Are you going to walk through that open door? We have committed in the month of October, and I even think we're going to go into November on this concept of house of prayer. Grove Avenue will be a house of prayer, and we've prayed for multiple things. We've prayed for our loved ones. We've prayed for people that are watching, and today we pray we pray for the lost, and we pray for the courage and the opportunity to share the gospel. Our key verse for this passage, or for the series, is Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. It says that my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. My house will be a house of prayer for all nations. 
We started a couple weeks ago in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, talking, focusing on prayer. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 said this, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and thankful heart. We also notice in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it said, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert, be persistent in your prayers. We focused on that first week of being alert, being aware. Alert means specific, devoting ourselves. Pray in the spirit at all times and all occasions. We stress that if you pray at all times, then you will by default be prepared when the occasion comes. Colossians chapter four, verse three, and Ephesians chapter six, verse 18 and 19, pray for us also. That's what we talked about last week. Pray for us also, Ephesians chapter six, verse 18 and 19. Pray for all believers everywhere and pray for me too. Pray for me too. Colossians chapter four, verse three. We continue the text today. Here's the prayer request. Pray for the lost. Pray for an opportunity to share with the lost. And pray that you have the courage to go through that open door and take advantage of that opportunity. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. Pray that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. Now stop right there. Take a look at that verse. It's very interesting. Colossians and Ephesians 6 are parallel passages, so they're going to help each other out. And Colossians and Ephesians, as you well know, over the past couple weeks, they actually, Colossians and Ephesians, have approximately 30 direct quotes or very close quotes to each other. They were written at the same time, delivered by the same guy, Tychicus. And so the, the sentiment, the thoughts, even though they're going to two churches, are identical. So you have slight differences. Here Colossians makes a statement, and in a moment Ephesians will define the word mystery. So here it says that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. Now stop right there. The word many opportunities, anaxes, thuron, the literal translation, and some translations say this, pray that I have an open door. That's what it says. Literally, but then some translations actually say just what we say. Pray that it gives us many opportunities. The words open door in the Greek, and when it's used that way, anoixe thuron, when it's used that way, uh, the scripture, if you read the New Testament, whenever it says pray that it has an open door, pray that it has an open door, three times in the book of Acts, pray I get an open door, it is a figurative, not quite an idiom, but a first century figurative statement that means give me an opportunity. So that's why this translation just goes to that. It says, give me an opportunity, an open door. But here's what I want you to catch. Paul is in prison. According to the last two verses in the book of Acts, he is held under house arrest for two years. Two years. Note that. He is locked down. This is year number one. He wrote Ephesians Colossians, Philemon, year number one, at the end of the second, almost at the second year, he writes the book of Philippians. He's got one more year to go. Rome had this belief system, kind of this legal system that you could hold someone and detain them for two years unless a charge was brought up. If a charge wasn't brought up, then you could release them. Today, I don't know what it is, it's like 72 hours, 24 hours, if you don't have a charge back then, you could retain someone for two years. So no charges have brought up, but what got him into prison? Now catch this, what got him into prison? He was doing fine from Acts 21 to 23 until he made one statement. And the moment he made a statement, it put him in prison. He was like, in fact, in Acts chapter 21, it says that he spoke in the Hebrew tongue. So all the Jewish authorities were very impressed. And it says that they paused and they listened to him because he spoke in the Hebrew tongue. And he spoke of how Jesus might be the Messiah. Jesus might be the Messiah. Now, Jewish people didn't like that at the time, but at least he was debating their theological argument. So in other words, this was like a theological group having a theological discussion. So he's talking about Jesus could be the Jewish Messiah. Jesus could be the Jewish Messiah. He really could be. And then he makes a statement in Acts chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. He says, and he has also appointed me to share this same gospel with the Gentiles. And that moment, they said, this man should be erased from the face of the earth. And they created a mob riot, and the authorities conceded, and they put him away for two years because he said that the gospel should go to the world. He is in prison for one out of two years, and he's praying for a, quote, open door. 
not to get released from prison. He is not, catch this, especially in the era of a pandemic, he is not praying for things to go back to normal. He is praying that in this season of his life, God would give him miraculous opportunities to share the gospel. God can still give opportunities for ministry to occur, even locked down in chains. He does not pray for his release, but he prays that while he is bound, God would give him opportunities in this crazy two-year season of his life so that the gospel could spread. He did not pray for normal. He prayed for God to act now. I want normal, he says, but, but I don't need normal. All I want to see is the hand of God working. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 Builds this, verse 19 builds this up, Ephesians 6, 19. Same verse, he defines this, watch this. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly get out of prison? No. Boldly explain God's mysterious plan, here's the definition, that the good news is for the Jews and Gentiles. I don't need to be freed to see God's hand at work. Go to Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. Colossians 4, 3, B. That is why I am in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Don't pray for me to be released. Pray that in this crazy season, God gets glory. Pray that he can, he can. Pray that God in this crazy season will receive glory and honor. So in the midst of the abnormal, give me the clear, bold, spoken words to be able to share the gospel to all the nations, no matter what it is. It's really interesting that in Colossians and Ephesians, the word for speaking boldly, every time in our passage, you see the word speaking boldly, speaking right, speaking the right words. They, it's a Greek word, lalein, which is interesting. It is not a preaching word. It's not a proclaiming word. It's actually, lalein means conversational speaking. Catch that. Conversational speaking. I think that is the most powerful form of communicating the gospel. You see, the contrary is preaching like I am. It's easy. This is one directional. You can't say much back. I guess you could, but I don't know what would happen. <laughs> though I like the amens, though. Some of you let me know where I'm at, and I like that. But literally, like, like this is, this is Caruso. This is proclaiming the gospel. La Lane means I'm in prison. I have no platform. So however the opportunities intersect with me, may I be ready to converse about the truths of Christ. Even though it's crazy and even though people can't come into the church, the way the gospel is going to be reaching the commonwealth and Virginia and the world right now is for us to go into our workplaces and to go into our very small groups. And as we're social distance and just go crazy world, isn't it? Sure glad I have peace today and you spark some kind of conversation because that is where people live and that's where the raw questions come. That's where the honesty is exhibited and that's the point where Christians come and he says, I don't have a platform. I'm not traveling to churches. That funding and traveling is all stopped. So whatever Praetorian guard comes in my path, I will share the gospel with them. And whatever visitor comes my way, I'll share the gospel with him. One year after this passage, one year after this passage, he writes Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Here's his report on how this is going. He tells Ephesians and Colossians, pray, pray, pray. I want an opportunity. I want an opportunity. I want an opportunity. One year later, he gives his progress report. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. He says, I want you to understand, brethren, that the things that have happened to me have resulted, yes, in the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are being crystal clearly known to every single Praetorian guard. That's a Navy SEAL, by the way. Every single Praetorian guard and many of the Jewish people in the Lord are coming to Christ. And at the end of the letter, he says, oh, no, by the way, I'll say goodbye and check out for now, but I'll tell everyone of Caesar's household who has accepted Christ that you say hello. The gospel was spreading regardless of his chains. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 9 says, 
2 Timothy 2.9, he says, For even though I am bound and suffering and chains like a criminal, please know the word of God cannot be bound. No matter what we're dealing with, no matter what we're in right now, no matter what crazy season of life, I know I am human. I am praying for normal. But let's not wait for normal to, to, to pray for a lively gospel-led ministry to happen. Gos the gospel is spreading in this place. And I'm praying for God. God, give us an open door of opportunity to share the gospel to the world. God has already done that. God has already done the last couple of weeks one of the most beautiful blessings. I get this text message of a little blonde-haired girl. Her name is Anna Hawkins. She's five years old with her mom. Anna Hawkins, a couple weeks ago, accepted Jesus Christ in this building through our children's ministry. <laughs> little Anna, little Anna was sitting right back there in section E in vacation Bible school. All of us on stage, we were over here and we said, there were tons of kids, they all look cute. We said, did you see that cute little girl with those pink glasses? We kind of mentally just adopted her. In fact, Emily Damon, she said that she's a little me. It was so cute. All week we just said, hey, how you doing, how you doing? She goes to our children's ministry. Her mom lets Kelly teach you know that she accepted Jesus. And if that wasn't enough, the Lord wasn't done with five-year-olds. Little Evelyn, little Evelyn Garland, who sent me a video the other day and she was, we were just having fun. I hear from her dad that little Evelyn accepted Jesus Christ a couple weeks ago as well. And if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough, this week at Grove Christian School in the third grade, we had not one, not two, but three kids accept Christ right over in our school wing over there. We had one accept, rededicate themselves to the Lord. I'm telling you, we don't need things to be normal unless I know we really want them to be normal, but our focus right now should be God. Being back to normal is up to you. We trust you with all of our heart on that. But while we're in this season, I pray that you'll give Grove Avenue Baptist Church an open door to share the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God can do it, and God can do it through you. And when you get that opportunity to share the gospel, take advantage. When God opens that door, think about what is it? What is it that prevents you from walking through that open door? Is it fear of stumbling your words? Is it a fear that you'll be mocked? Do not listen to the lies of the devil because that open door is a God-ordained moment for you to share the truth of life change that can happen, that can forever change a family, that can forever change a soul. If you fear you're stumbling your words, tell them, hey, I'm about to stumble my words, but I have something really important I need to tell you. If you're fear of what to say, say, I don't have all the answers, but listen, I've got a church and we've got a bunch of people that'll help us find the answers. Let's do it together. There is nothing, nothing like seeing someone's heart redeemed right in front of your eyes. Nothing at all. There's nothing like seeing someone who is dark and dead inside. Translate from darkness into light. There's nothing like seeing a heart going, man, this is the message I needed to hear and no one had the courage of showing me. When they walk out of that grave spiritually, when they realize that forever they are walking on this earth knowing that they have peace with God now and an eternity with the Lord later, there is nothing like having the blessing of doing that. And that's what we're gonna pray at the end of this service for. We're gonna pray, think of a name, think of a name and then pray for an opportunity. Pray you'll have the courage to have that opportunity because I wanna see the kingdom filled, not Grove Avenue Baptist Church. I wanna see the kingdom of God grow for his glory and his glory alone, amen? Join us standing, let's sing and praise the Lord. I walked out of that grave. Put your hands together. I was buried my shame 
this morning and let's not we're not finished yet we're not finished yet you want to worship just a little bit more this morning I think you can do that in the darkness we were waiting without hope without light to from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophet to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Oh, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the
Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to watch this and other Victory Hour presentations on the internet by visiting grovav.tv. Please remember that this program is viewer supported. It's your prayers and offerings that help us meet our airtime expenses. If you would like to help, you can call us at 804-740-8888 or you can write us at 8701 Ridge Road, Richmond, Virginia, 23229. We hope that you have been encouraged by today's program. Please join us again next week as we gather for worship, for prayer, and for Bible study, live on the Victory Hour. With every head bowed, every eye closed. Your pew now is your altar. If you feel like you want to sit and pray, if you want to stand and pray, if you want to kneel in the aisle, whatever you wish to do right now is your, your prayer time, whatever posture. I'm not even looking at it. It's up to you and the Lord. For those continuing to watch us online, you join us and you have a moment of prayer and join us in this prayer time. I ask you to pray for these things. First, would you pray for a name? Picture them in your head. Pray for a name. I know it's hard during a pandemic season not to lift up prayers, but I'll never forget the text message I got from a man that said, I devoted, I devoted for the next 40 days not to pray for myself. And he told me his prayer experiences have been amazing. So just for this moment, not for yourself, pray for a name. Pray for someone that you know needs the gospel. Picture them. Coworker, friend, loved one. Someone that desperately needs the gospel. To cut through the darkness, the facade, the masquerade they may be carrying around, but all the while, they're scared. Pray for that name. for that name. Plead with the Lord. You know how badly they need the gospel. Don't just inform God of their name and treat the dear Holy One. Lord, they need you. Burden their souls, God, right now for you. I pray for my loved one, Lord. 
stir his heart even in this very moment for you. Plead with the Lord for their salvation. Because somebody's family is praying for that person right now so passionately. They're praying for someone to share the gospel with him or her because that person has shut their ears. So the second prayer request, let's transfer our prayer request to, Lord, give me an opportunity to share the gospel with that person or somebody. Open the door. I pray for an open door, Lord, this week for that person or someone else. Open the door right in front of my eyes to share the gospel. And then pray for the courage to walk through that door. Oh, that's the hard part. God, there are loved ones. There are people that need the gospel. Lord, give us the open door, the perfect opportunity to share with him or somebody. But Lord, when you open that door, give every single person listening and in this house, every single person the courage to walk through. Now, right now in your prayers, identify what is it that keeps you from taking advantage of that opportunity? What is it? Is it fear? Pray that the Lord will overcome your fear. Is it courage? Because you don't know the right words, then, then say, Lord, give me the words and let me be honest with the person that I may have to come back later with answers. But don't let that overcome that, Lord, in my heart. Maybe you fear that you're just not a person that likes to talk to people. You certainly can communicate via technology. I've seen people accept Christ in chat rooms, for goodness sake. Whatever it takes, whatever that fears, whatever keeps you from walking through that open door, say, Lord, this week when you open that door, overcome my, and then fill in the blank. Overcome it, Lord. For over 32 weeks, we have been in a pandemic. We have been thinking about our situation. But this week, the scriptures say, eyes off of us, everybody. Eyes on to the lost because you'll find that that'll get you through. Jason, in a moment, we'll sing that wonderful chorus you added on to the service in a moment as, after I pray. Lord, I come on behalf of these, your people. Lord, I lift them up as an offering to you. As you tell us, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you form yourselves a living sacrifice. Lord, I give this sacrifice to you, the Grove Church. We're not perfect, Lord. You know our weaknesses, you know our sins, you know our fears and our trepidations. But Lord, we are praying this week that you would open the door for us to be able to share the gospel and to overcome whatever it is in our lives that would keep us from walking through. And we, Lord, promise we will not listen to the lies of the devil. Just like the evil one tried to keep you, O oh Lord, from going to the cross, we will not listen to the lies of the devil that tries to keep us from sharing the beautiful truth of you going to the cross. Overcome our fears. Lord, thank you that you give us a life-changing message to share. Lord, there, people right now are dealing with such challenges, they may even be having a problem right now praying for someone else and not themselves. Lord, for those few, just touch their heart right now. That means they're grieving so badly right now. Give them hope that you're in control and give them an opportunity to share the gospel in the middle of chaos. As we continue in pray, as we sing this chorus, just like how we did, top to bottom, Jason, would you? I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. 
won't you sing that chorus again with us? I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. these are good people. I love them so much. Would you take them through this week, Lord, and show them the joy of their salvation? And Lord, show them the joy of how wonderful it is to share that good news with others. Lord, give us a week where we cannot help but praise and thank you. You are so good to us. You are so good to us. You are so good to us. We love you. We praise you this day. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Let's just praise the Lord this morning. Mm. Praise the Lord. You can be seated or you can stand or dance. I don't care. Uh, God is so, so good. Oh, praise the Lord. Well, I want you to know that I am so glad that you're here today. And for those of you continuing on with us, if you need anything, you reach out to us. We have uh, some caring listeners. You can call the church, whatever it is. We've got a lot of shoulders you can cry on and pray with, and we would be happy to minister to you. So thank you so much for joining, and we'll see you next week.